How do you make decisions? Everybody here makes a lot of them, right? We make them all day long, every day. It's impossible to know how many decisions we're called upon to make, but all of us know we have to make them. Well, how do you make decisions? Maybe you are the type of person that goes by conventional wisdom. You know, conventional wisdom is you just ask yourself, what would the majority of people do? And, you know, sometimes that's the right thing to do because the reason the majority of people do it is it makes sense to do it that way. Tradition, whatever. So sometimes conventional wisdom is just the automatic best way to go. Other times we may say, well, I want to weigh the pros and cons. And whether you do it with a, a list or whether you just do it mentally, you ask yourself, what are the benefits? What are the downside? And hopefully if the benefits outweigh the liabilities, you go with that. And that's how you make decisions. Or maybe you ask other people's advice. You say, what would you do? What do you think I ought to do? And uh, there's been too few a times when I've done that. I wish I would have done that more in life. And then, of course, as Christians, we say, what does the Bible say? What does Scripture say? And I pray through what it is God is saying to me. Uh, or maybe you just flip a coin and say, well, you know, let's see what happens, you know. But a while back, I was approached by a group of Christian leaders to get involved in a ministry. And automatically I thought, well, that'd be great. Uh, yes, of course. That sounds fantastic. And um, it was something I'd always thought about in the back of my mind. And I was just surprised one day when this group said, hey, we want you to be involved in this opportunity. I said, yeah, absolutely. The next day, all day that day, I was thinking, boy, I'll do, here's what I'll do. I'll do th the next day for no, nothing changed. But the next day or real close, I think it was the next day, it was like I knew for certain there's no way I should be involved in this. This is not me. No way. In fact, I was so strong on it that I thought, I need to call the people who I said yes to yesterday and tell them that after reflection, I, I, don't, I don't need to be doing this. But, you know, I got busy doing something. And before I could call them, I read online that I was doing it. It was an email or Twitter or something. I thought, oh, great. Now what? So I thought, well, you know, let me just, I'll just, you know, go ahead and do it. And from the minute I got involved, and there was, listen, there was nothing wrong with it. Nothing, nothing at all. There was no rational reason for me to feel this way. There was no sinfulness. There was no disobedience. There was no compromise. There was no scriptural reason. But I'm just telling you, I knew this is not where I need to be. This is not what I need to be doing. This isn't for me. And I'll be honest with you, I've never felt that way in my life this strong about anything. In fact, I've spent most of my life saying yes to things, and I'm trying to learn how to say no to things. But in this case, I felt absolutely like this is the wrong place, the wrong time. This isn't me. And some of you know what I'm talking about because, you know, while I didn't want to just quit because it's just not in me to quit, it's just not my nature, I just don't want to do that, it just seems like the wrong thing to do, I was calling people and saying, what do you think I ought to do? Shouldn't I quit? And every Christian leader I talked to said, no, 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 you can't quit, you've got to stay with us. So what was the deal? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating when I tell you, I felt like I was under a black cloud with this. Like I have really stepped into something that I have no business being involved in. And again, no sin, no disobedience, no compromise, no scriptural reason, no circumstantial reason why I shouldn't do it. It was a feeling. And I don't really operate that way, usually. So what was it? Well, when you strip away all the things that might have been and wasn't, you're left with just one truth. In my mind, I simply had no peace whatsoever about it no peace. And the truth of the matter is, God has given to every believer a built-in navigation system, an onboard navigation system. And that navigation system is to guide us and to help us to determine whether or not we should do things, say things, where are the guidelines, what are the right and wrong things, how do we determine the will of God. And that built-in navigational system is the peace of God. Can I get peace? Now, let me quickly say, and I want to warn us not to carry too, that too far because there are guidelines to that. Having or determining or sensing peace in a situation 
is not the only way we determine the will of God. In fact, it's not even the most important way we determine the will of God. But it is something that God has given to each and every believer so that we will know how to determine the will of God for our life, and that is the rule of peace. And that's what I want us to look at this morning as we look together at the subject, the peaceful heart. Would you open up your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3? Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to look at verse 15. And by the way, while you're turning there, let me just put a cap on that story. After I was involved with it for a while, I realized, oh, this is why God wants me here, and now everything's fine. So I didn't quit. I stayed with it, but man, I felt so uneasy about it until some circumstances changed and I realized, oh, this is why God has me here. So let's look today at the fact that you and I have a built-in navigational system for helping us determine God's plan for our life, not the only one and not even the most important one, but one we can't live without. So would you look at Colossians 3.15? The Bible says this, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you indeed were called in one body, and be thankful. That's all we're going to look at today, just that verse. And let the peace of Christ rule rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. So what is real peace? What is it? And how can you find it? How can I know that I'm over the target area of real peace in my life? Well, let me tell you where real peace does not come from. Can I do that? Are you ready? Real peace of mind, real peace of heart, knowing the peace of God does not come from financial security. You say, wait a minute, you're crazy, man. What are you talking about? Well, uh, having more money does not give you peace, God's peace. Now, it may give you financial security, and there's a lot to be said for that. Amen. Can I get a big amen? But my dad used to have a little plaque. My dad was in business. He had a little plaque on his desk. He said, money can't buy happiness, neither can poverty. Because the truth of the matter is those things, that which we accumulate really does not speak to the deep issue of our lives, and that is, how do I have the peace of Christ? Because uh, you can have much more than you've ever had before and have more anxiety, more disunity, more disruption, and more uh, pressure, and more worry than when you had nothing at all. A person who has very little can be filled with the peace of God. And a person that has a whole lot can be disrupted all the time. So having financial security is really not the source of peace. And may I just say this tenderly, lovingly, gently, medication is not the source of peace. Now really, this isn't a joke. There are so many of us who need something from the medicine counter to help us cope with life. And when you need it and when uh, credible people, uh, you know, prescribe it, it can be helpful. But those things which level you out and give you the ability to cope with life on a day-to-day basis, never mistake that for the peace of God. Not only that, the approval of others does not give you peace. So many of us spend our lives just want to make sure, oh, I want everybody to like me. I I don't want to be the one to break it to you, but can you look at me real quickly? I like you. But listen, not everybody likes you. You say, what? If you think everybody likes if you think everybody likes you, you don't know enough people. So if you spend now Don't misunderstand me. The Bible says a good name is to be chosen above silver and gold. So the Bible says that John the Baptist grew in stature and favor with God and man, and that Jesus had the favor of all the people. So there is definitely an advantage to being liked over being disliked. I've tried them both, amen. But if you spend your life searching for the approval of other people, it is a constantly moving target. It's like your leaves when they fall off the tree and the wind blows. You'll just chase them around the yard. Searching for the approval of others is not the way you find lasting, satisfactory peace in life. Personal achievements is not the way to peace. You think, if I just get this job promotion, if I just get put on this club, if I get elected to that position, you can build your resume to be the strongest resume in Austin, Texas, and be the most disrupted person with no peace in your life. Relationships 
While we want good relationships with our wives, our kids, our husbands, our, our parents, our co-workers, our friends, good relationships are highly valued, but they are not the source of peace like we want to talk about. And so there's a long list of what peace is not, but let me just say this. Peace for a believer comes from our relationship with Jesus Christ and nowhere else. That is really the source and the only source of our peace. All these other things are really very good blessings that may come along with it. I like what C.S. Lewis, the Oxford and Cambridge University literature professor, once said, God cannot give us a happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. So what is it? If we know what it isn't, what is peace? Well, we know it's a gift from Jesus. Peace is a gift from Jesus. Because remember in John 14, verse 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Do you understand that what Jesus is saying is this, that Jesus Christ in the flesh walked in, lived in, exuded peace. And when you and I are connected with him and aligned with him and in relationship with him, we are benefiting from the peace that he has. That's why he said, I'm not giving you a peace that's never existed before. I'm not giving you a unique peace that is unique only to you. He said, my peace I give to you. In other words, I am a person of peace. He's called the what? Prince of what? Peace. And he said, I've lived my whole existence in peace it comes all throughout every part of me. Anywhere you touch me, you'll find peace. And when you're in alignment with me, when you're in relationship with me, when you're my follower, you're my disciple, the peace that's in me flows directly into you. Just like a branch of a tree benefits from the sap, the nutrients, the life that's in the tree, so the believer benefits from the peace that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we are in alignment with him and when we are walking with him, the peace that is in him flows directly with great abundance into us. And then may I say this as we just get into the introduction of what is peace. Peace, as we describe it today, doesn't always make sense. It isn't always rational. Now, most of us like everything pretty well guaranteed. Amen? The older I get, the more guarantees I want in life. Amen? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, when you're at a certain point in your life, you say to yourself, well, you know, let's take some chances. And then the closer you get to the finish line, the more you want to eliminate the risks. Am I right or wrong? So when I say this to you, it may come as a little bit of a surprise, but experiencing peace doesn't always make sense. Mathematically, it doesn't always add up. You can't put it in a test tube. And the reason I say that is for this. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, Paul said, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Sometimes peace doesn't make sense. Let me give you an example. I've been walking with the Lord for more than 40 years now. And I can't tell you the number of times when I've been called into a hospital room when a friend of mine or a member of the church or a believer who I, maybe sometimes I don't even know has just received the worst diagnosis possible. And I can tell you as a pastor, and it doesn't matter who the pastor is, it could be me or any number of the pastors you've ever known, every one of us walking into that situation walks in with a spirit of hesitation, wondering what in the world am I going to say in a moment like this. And I cannot tell you, I mean, it is beyond my ability to estimate the number. I cannot tell you how many times I've walked into those tragic situations of loss where there should be fear and panic and chaos, and I've had a believer look at me after receiving the worst possible news and say, but I'm at peace. And you know it. And you know it. Because the kind of peace I'm talking about just doesn't always make sense because it passes understanding. And, and you may say, well, I don't like that. I like things to make sense. Well, at some point, I hope you get to the place where you're thankful to God there are some things in life bigger than what you're able to comprehend. There's great comfort in knowing that there's some things that are much bigger than you are. And then 
I would also add to you that when we're defining what peace is, it's part of the fruit of the Spirit. Because in Galatians 5.22, the Bible says, and the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering. Look at the great company peace is in. When you think about all these attributes that you want in your life, love and joy and patience, well, you don't want any patience, but all these other things you want. And one of those benefits is what? Peace. In other words, when you're walking in the Spirit and living in the Spirit and asking the Lord to fill you with His Spirit, one of the ways you'll recognize the Spirit's activity in your life is one of the outgrowths of the presence of the Spirit is the peace of God that flows through your life. So let's look today at this passage of Scripture. And let's notice a central truth that has been described here for us, and that is that God calls His people to a life of peace. God calls his people to a life of peace. Look at verse 15 in Colossians again. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. God wants every one of us to enjoy peace. He he wants peace to define us. He literally calls us to a life of peace. Peace. Francis of Assisi once said, while you are proclaiming peace with your lips, be careful to have it even more fully in your heart. It's one thing for us to say peace is a part of the Christian life. It's another thing for us to say, I'm going to live this out. Now, over the last few weeks, we've been looking at this section of Scripture in chapter 3, and if you remember in verses 9 through 14, the grammatical tie-in, the one set of words or phrases that tied the last few sermons or ideas together in Colossians 3 was the repetition of put on, put off. Remember? We looked at that for a couple of weeks. Put on the new self. Put off the old self. But here in verse 15, Paul moves away from that metaphor and that idea, and he moves to a different word that ties the next couple verses together. He says in verse 15, and let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. And then in verse 16, which we'll look at another, in another message, in verse 16, he immediately says, and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You see the word let. No longer put on and put off, but let. Now, when we think of letting something occur, We think, first of all, of allowing it, tolerating it, putting up with it. We're going to let it happen. And by virtue of that, it's a passive action. We're just kind of the beneficiaries of it. But I want you to understand something. That's just the English way of expressing something in the language of the New Testament that isn't quite exactly that. First of all, it's not passive. There is such a thing as a passive verb. In other words, the action is happening to me. But this is an active verb. It's almost like you could translate it, and you lose some of the sense of it, but in English, you almost have to translate it, make the peace of God rule in your life. Because it's an active thing, and it's an imperative. It's an instruction. And so what I'm calling this is the calling of peace. You and I are called to peace. And when we begin to understand this peace of God, it is the calling of peace, that an imperative instruction, let the peace of Christ rule. So where's the verb? Rule. The word rule is the verb. Peace is a noun. Peace is a thing. Ruling is the verb. And it's an imperative, and it's active. Let, make it happen. Don't sit back and wait for it to happen. As my dad used to say to me, son, get after it. (laughs) And when it comes to peace, it's not something that we're going to sit back and hope for. We're going to do whatever it takes to get after it, to experience it, and to live it. And this word for rule is a sports word. You know, the Greeks love sports. They have all these amphitheaters. If you travel the Mideast, Greece, uh, part of uh, Eastern Europe and even Western Europe, go to Italy, uh, Turkey in the Mideast, you'll see stadiums everywhere. Oh, man, they built the most incredible stadiums. They're still there because they love sports. I mean, think about where we got the Olympics, right? And this word for rule describes an actual person. It's not one of the players. It's not the athlete. It's the guy on the field determining if the players are playing by the what? 
the rules. We would call it an umpire. This is actually the word for referee. I tease Kent all the time because he used to be a basketball referee. And we love basketball. We talk about it all the time. And so this word, let the peace of Christ rule. Let's get into what that means. Look at what God is calling you and me to. That somehow, some way, you and I should have this umpire in our life, this referee in our life that is determining whether or not what we're hearing and what we're experiencing is contributing to the peace of God. And if what is happening in our life or what, come here, what we're allowing to happen in our life or what we're starting to believe about life is not true to God and true to the rule of Christ, the umpire, the ref steps in and says, whoa, technical foul, flag on the field. You say, what are you talking about? Well, remember, Paul wrote Colossians for two reasons. One, to disciple new believers, because everybody here was a new Christian. And number two, because there were false teachers in the Colossian church. They had invaded the church. We don't fully appreciate what that heresy was. In fact, it was so unique, it's called the Colossian heresy. Isn't it amazing that truth works the same in China and South America and Europe, and Australia, and Texas, but falsehood takes on all kinds of different manifestations. So we don't even know where the Colossian heresy came from. Maybe it was one really impressive individual, somebody with some real skills of persuasion, who had taken some truths and began to manipulate that truth in a way that the Colossians were being confused by. And Paul is stepping in. And this is where the water hits the wheel for the 21st century. How many of you know there are a lot of weird ideas in the world we live in today? A heresy and crazy thinking didn't go away in Paul's day. And if you and I are not careful, even the church of Jesus Christ, which is made up of individuals like you and me, even we can be influenced by bad thinking and wrong ideas. And we've got to have a what? A filter. We've got to have a grid by which we filter out the wrong from the right to allow all the right to come in and all the wrong to be filtered out. And, of course, our main filter is what? The Word of God. But when a false teacher comes with a passage of Scripture and begins to manipulate that Scripture in a way that you say, well, I've never heard this before. And I don't mean that the pastor stands up and tells you something about a passage of Scripture. You think, oh, that's good information. I never heard that. But it's truth that's been around for 2,000 years. You just hadn't heard it before, and now you're informed. I mean, false teachers always do this. They start with something you know, and they begin to manipulate it. They begin to change it. They stretch it into a dimension and, and, and a form that you don't even recognize, and it disrupts you, and you begin to get confused about it. And it makes you question what you've known. It makes you question the other leaders you've known. It makes you question the Word of God itself. And that's exactly what was happening in Colossae. And so Paul said, I'm going to give you an additional form. I'm going to give you an additional grid. I'm going to give you another filter. Let the peace of Christ rule. So the peace of Christ rule is simply this. I'm not going to allow falsehood into my life if I am disrupted, if I no longer experience peace. Now, I'm very cautious with teaching this because we as a culture have been so distanced from the objective truth of God's Word. We don't know the Word of God the way Grandma did. And if we're not careful, you hear the teaching I've given today, and it just feeds the subjectivity of the way we approach everything. I'm very cautious on that. That's not what I'm saying. We've got to, we've got to apply this standard very carefully. And Paul knew that, and we should know it. Because if we're not careful, the subjective, are you all with me? the subjective becomes more important than the objective. Let me say it this way. If we're not careful, the longer we deal in how do I feel about it, the more how I feel about it becomes more important than the truth of it. I was listening to a podcast the other day 
A guy did an analysis of the way students write essays today versus the way they wrote essays 100 years ago. I think every person in this room would be interested in this. A hundred years ago, if students were handed a piece of paper and said, write an essay, they would all write about a big fire they saw at a barn or the sinking of the Titanic or some huge issue that they had read about that was happening in the culture. All 100 out of 100 would describe a current event to the best of their ability. You hand that same piece of paper to students today, they all describe something they feel. Because we have become a very subjective culture. So I'm saying there's a standard here. It's a subjective standard. You can't throw it out, but you've got to be careful with it. But when you feel that you are being influenced by an idea that is not lining up with what you've been taught, with the faith once delivered, when, that, when your peace is disrupted, you've got to throw a flag on the field and say, oh, time out. Now, on the other hand, Sometimes the best idea is an idea that disrupts us. Let me say that again. Sometimes the, the, the next best thing you can do is something that disrupts you from what you have right now. Because, listen, the only quo you know shouldn't be the status quo. And truth has a way of disrupting. It's just the nature of truth. But when you are dislodged from the body, when you no longer trust the book, when you no longer feel at home with the congregation of God's people because a new idea has influenced you, red alerts should be going off in your spirit. The, the, the rule of peace should step in, that this is not giving me peace. This is giving me confusion and internal chaos and disruption. Tina and I were in Hawaii several years ago on a spring break, and we went to church on the beach at a beach church. And I'll tell you, there's some real benefits to that, amen? <laughs> and we were sitting right next to a Hawaiian lady there on the beach. I mean, and, and I said, is this your church? And she said, yeah. I said, how long have you been coming here? A couple of years. I said, what do you like about it? She said, oh, I like pastor so-and-so. I said, and she had no idea who I was. And I said, well, what do you like about him? She said, oh, his sermons. I said, what do you like about his sermons? She said, he don't put no butter on it. <laughs> he don't put no butter on it. Now, what did she mean? He gives it to us straight. We can handle it. Give it to us straight. But we're living in a culture in which there's way too much butter being slathered on what we know to be true but we're sometimes confused. And the peace of God will bring us back to say, wait a minute, does this give me peace or confusion? That's the calling of peace. But then may I share with you that there is the congregation of peace. Now, this is a, this is a truth that will jump right off the page once you see it. Look what the Bible says here in verse 15. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Notice he didn't say your heart and by the way, leave that passage up for just a moment so everybody can see it. In English, the word you can be singular or plural. The word your can be singular or plural, but not so in the Greek New Testament. It is very clear whether it's singular or plural. And here Paul is speaking to a group of people. He said, let the peace of Christ rule in your, plural, hearts. And if you think, well, pastor, you're adding a little something to it, look at the next phrase. It's very clarifying. To which indeed you are called in one body. Paul is saying that the peace of Christ is something that we experience congregationally. This is so foreign to the way we think. The Western mindset, uh, mindset is highly individualistic. We continually ask one question, what's in it for me? But the New Testament is not focused on what's best for the individual. Now, you can't have peace individually and contribute to the peace of the group. So, there, you know, you've got to look at both sides of that truth. But Paul here is talking to a congregation, and he's urging a congregation to be so committed to one another as a group, so committed to the truth, that you're linked in and tied in to the peace of God that rules in the entire congregation. I mean, everything about the way we do business 
disrupts that. I mean, it's just hard to get to. I'll be the first to admit it. It's hard for us to do it. Our governance almost doesn't allow it. Because as soon as we get a group together, somebody's got to be in charge. But in this case, the peace of God flows through the entire congregation with unity. That it's almost like nobody's in charge. Nobody's in charge of being the peacekeeper or the guardian of the gate or holds the key to where all the peace is. Everybody in the congregation is to experience it collectively. I mean, it's almost impossible for us in the way we think and do business, it's almost impossible for us to even experience this but I have to wonder if this is exactly what happened in the uh, early church on the day of Pentecost. For 10 days in the upper room, they didn't know when the Spirit was coming. They didn't know how to expect the arrival of the Spirit, but they only knew that Jesus had told them to do one thing. What? Wait. Wait. And for 10 days, not knowing if it'd be 10 days, 100 days, 10 months, they didn't know. They were just told, wait, and in the, in, in, at the conclusion of your waiting, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit will be given. And for 10 days, they waited. Now, can you imagine everything wrong with that in the modern mind? Like, I'm going to stand up here and go, okay, we're going to get a lot of benefits, but here's what we're going to do. We're all going to get together. For the next 10 days, we're not going to leave this room. And what are we going to do, Pastor? We're going to pray. Who's in charge? Just Jesus. So what's the agenda? We don't have one. And what are we going to do? Wait. I'm out. Goodbye. Peace out. Uh, you have my proxy. I'm not coming. Why are you all looking at me like I just thought of something? You wouldn't come. Because we have gotten so individualistic in everything we do that we stand our ground and say, this far, no farther, this is what's in it for me. And if this congregation does not, well, let me just talk while I'm in the neighborhood. If this congregation doesn't meet my needs, peace, I'm out. Now, I'm not suggesting that a congregation should be abusive, abrasive, and difficult for a place for people to find fellowship. It's the opposite of that. But at what point does our individualism become a restrictive obstruction to our ability to really flow in the Spirit and experience everything God has for us? Paul's talking to a whole congregation. He said, let the peace of Christ dwell in your hearts because indeed you have been called to one body. And then let me just show you real quickly the consequence of peace. Can I show it to you? It's in verse 15. Look at it. Verse 15 says this, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called to one body and be thankful. Now, if you're like me, it looks like he's introduced a new idea. Because be thankful looks like another verb, right? Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. There's one verb. And be thankful. It's like a new idea, but it's not. It's not. Now, Paul loves the word thanksgiving. It's going to occur again in verse 16. It's going to occur again in verse 17. In fact, it occurs all throughout the book of Colossians. In fact, it's a verb in chapter 1, verse 3, and in chapter 1, verse 12, and in chapter 3, verse 17. It's a noun in chapter 2, verse 7, and in chapter 4, verse 2. But the only place in the entire New Testament where the word thankful is an adjective is right here. Now, you say, Pastor, it's been a long time since eighth grade grammar, so remind me again, what does that mean? Here's what it means. Being thankful is not a new idea. Thankfulness here describes the main verb, which is let the peace of Christ rule. This describes what the rule of peace looks like in our lives. It looks like a grateful people, a people that are full of gratitude. In fact, this is not that revolutionary of a concept, but it's only recently come to me, and that is this, life is too short to be a grouch. Life's too short to be a grouch. You know, griping, whining, and complaining is not a spiritual gift. <laughs> Amen. When you and I are living by the rule of peace, when we really have peace in our hearts and peace in our lives, one of the ways we're going to recognize that in each other, there's going to be so much gratitude 
and such a spirit of thankfulness in our lives. We're just going to be we're just going to be so thankful for all that God has done instead of constantly whining, complaining, griping, criticizing about what hasn't happened yet and about what we should have had that didn't happen and why it worked out for somebody else and not for me. Instead, we're going to live our whole lives going, thank you, Lord Jesus. You know, I get up every morning and pray, and I actually pray according to a list. I have a little a little notebook, and I kind of, I don't write out my prayers, but I kind of do a little checklist. I write out what I want to pray about, and then I check it off. You say, well, you're weird. Well, I'm on task, though. <laughs> and one of the things I've added this year, something that I became aware of that I wasn't spending enough time praying about, I add the word thanks on my prayer list. And every morning, real early in my prayer time, I mean, one of, not the first thing, but really one of the first things I pray about is this, Lord, I want to be thankful. I want to live my life with gratitude. I want to be a person of gratefulness. I want to be a person that knows how to say, thank you, Lord. And and long before I ever say, but Lord, I need this, and I'm out of that, and could you help me here? Long before I ever get to that, even if I ever do get to it some days, I start out every morning real early saying, Lord, I want to thank you. And I ask the Lord to make that practical. And sometimes that's just, thank you for my wife. Thank you for my kids. Thank you that I got a nice house to live in. Thank you that I have a wonderful job. Thank you that I have a great staff that I work with. Thank you, Lord, for my friends. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the privilege of prayer. Thank you for technology, because I love my iPhone and my MacBook and my iPad. No, really, I mean, just what can you be thankful for? And here's what I've found. According to the Word of God, if you've got peace, you'll have praise. Praise is not a secondary issue. It's an extension of the life of peace. Would you stand with me all over this place? Let me share this with you real quickly before we pray. There's only one place to find peace, and that's in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Everything I just described is for those who follow Jesus. If you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ and you feel in your life, listen, I don't have peace internally. I mean, externally I try to keep it together, but internally there's a lot of chaos, a lot of confusion, a lot of doubt, a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of guilt. But what I really need is what you're talking about. Well, the formula is real simple. Know Jesus and you'll know peace. No Jesus, no peace. Do you know Jesus? Because when you receive him, you receive everything that he has. Let's pray together. Father, I bow before you, O God. Lord, not as one who has arrived, but as one who's willing to press on. And I'm asking you, Lord God, right now to stir within us a desire for more of Jesus. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, If you do not know the Lord Jesus, if he's not your Savior, if you're not his follower, his disciple, this morning you can really have a relationship with God through his Son, Jesus Christ, by simply calling upon the name of the Lord. And just admit to him, Lord, I've sinned against you. He already knows it. It's better for us to admit it, get it out of the way. Cleansing comes after confession. Confession. 